Okay, this is a video on the history of numbers, and here we've made it to part five. This is Fibonacci and the history of the Hindu Arabic numbers. My name is Scott Vaughn. I'm a math instructor at Montgomery County Community College. Okay, this is a picture of Fibonacci from the internet. Uh, he's also known as Leonardo of Pisa. He was an Italian mathematician who lived from about 1175 to 1250 A.D. Fibonacci is famous for introducing the Hindu Arabic numbers into Europe. Of course, the Hindu Arabic numbers are the numbers that you see here, the digits that we're all familiar, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 0, written this way. Uh, and he's also famous for the Fibonacci sequence that we'll look at in this video as well. So the origins of the Hindu Arabic, modern numerals, the Hindu Arabic numbers, 0 through 9, now in use throughout the world, began in various forms around 300 BC in Asia. Uh, and they spread through the Near East, India, and then the Middle East, which is uh, around Iraq and Iran. And then they finally began appearing in some European texts in Italy and Spain around 1000. Uh, it was Fibonacci who wrote a book in Italy in 1202 that really popularized the use of these Hindu Arabic uh, numbers. And it was over the next several hundred years that the Hindu Arabic numbers spread through the rest of Europe and eventually replaced the Roman numerals. It's the invention of the printing press in the 1400s. They began to further standardize the forms of these numbers. They looked slightly different over this period. And then as the printing press began to uh, be used, they were becoming more and more uh, sort of in a standard form. Uh, the Europeans used both the Roman numerals and the Hindu Arabic numbers until finally around 1500, the Hindu Arabic numbers were the most common number system. Uh, Fibonacci used similars, uh, symbols similar to these in his book, Liber Abaki. So these are Western Arabic numerals, and you can see how they look similar to what we use now. Uh, those are the symbols, that, the way they looked at the time of Fibonacci. Uh, this is saying 950 uh, in the Common Era, or the Christian Era, and so it was really 300 years later when Fibonacci saw them. They were already in use uh, in, uh, by Muslim scholars um, at, uh, for hundreds of years by the time uh, Fibonacci saw them. Uh, so here is some evolution of these Hindu Arabic numbers from about 2,000 uh, years ago uh, to about 500 years ago. So uh, this is India. These are, this is Brahmi, the first century of the Common Era. So in this period, right after the birth of Christ in India, the numbers that uh, eventually became our numbers, they certainly looked very different uh, than our current ones. Uh, and these are still uh, the numbers, the way they were written uh, in, uh, in India uh, around... Um, this is uh, around the 9th century, so something around 800. I will just mention also that this 800-year period from the 1st century to the 9th century uh, was really important in the history of mathematics because this is where the Indian mathematicians begin to use this, the number zero, the, the concept of zero as an actual number. You see the symbol show up right there by the 9th century uh, in India. Now, it continued in the Western Arabic mathematics. It isn't listed on this particular diagram, but it was there. And then it's again, it's showing up in this uh, diagram in the, in the 15th century. But it was certainly uh, used by uh, Fibonacci. He was using place value just the way that we do. It, uh, it was uh, these numbers that then sort of got sort of used by Arabs. And there were two forms. There were the Western Arabic and the Eastern Arabic. And they were also continued to evolve somewhat in India. It was the Western Arabic form that Fibonacci saw and brought into Italy around the year 1200. And uh, then they were, for several hundred years, uh, slowly evolving until the printing press. And they began to take on this form and finally evolved to our modern form. Um, this is a 2,000-year period right? that goes all the way back to the first century uh, the common era up until uh, the modern time, and uh, and Fibonacci is right there in the middle of that. Uh, so a thousand years pass, 
uh, and they're evolving to this point. And then Fibonacci brings these numbers into Italy, and then another thousand years pass, and they've reached this point. So Fibonacci, he was born in Pisa, Italy, and he was three years old uh, when the construction of the Leaning Tower of Pisa was beginning. He was a, when he was a young boy, he was taught to do arithmetic using Roman numerals like everyone else in Europe, which was really difficult. Uh, this is a picture of somebody using um, a uh, Roman numerals to do calculations in an abacus. Adding and subtracting with Roman numerals was already difficult. Multiplying was even worse and required using an abacus. You can actually, um, uh, I think this is, yeah, this is an, uh, you can download for your iPhone a Roman uh, abacus so that you could actually do calculations the, the way that uh, Fibonacci would have done it, the way the ancient Romans did it. And then even people in the Middle Ages were doing uh, calculations um, even a thousand years after Rome, after the uh, Roman Empire. They're still using in Italy and in Europe, they're still doing a little bit of what, what little math they could do uh, with, with Roman numerals and with, with an abacus. Uh, so it was, it was very difficult to do. They weren't making very much progress. Uh, Business transactions were difficult. There was, uh, and you know, if you think about it with an abacus, there's nothing really to write down. You can only write down your result. Um, and uh, one of the benefits of the uh, Hindu Arabic numbers was that there were also, along with it, methods of showing how to do adding and subtracting, multiplying, dividing, where you could actually write out some work and show how it was done. Uh, and, uh, and that was important as well. So I was going to say, business transactions, of course, science, were not able to progress. There was these... Uh, thousand years of, of dark ages in, the, in, in Europe because of stuck with these Roman numerals. Uh, and finally, uh, Fibonacci makes it down to uh, North Africa in, uh, in Algeria, what's now called Algeria, um, at the time was, uh, was known as Bougia. And uh, he travels from Pisa to Algeria and, uh, and, and discovers the... Um, numbers and the, uh, the, the way in which the calculations are done by Muslim merchants and, uh, and scholars and he's impressed by how much better this is than the, uh, compared to the Roman numerals and uh, when Fibonacci was, he was 14 years old, he went to live with his father in Algeria his father's business involved trade between Italy and Algeria and while he was in Algeria Fibonacci learns these Hindu Arabic numbers and how much easier they are for arithmetic compared to Roman numerals so he's about 30 years old, Fibonacci returns to Pisa and he writes a book about what he learned from the Arab merchants and the scholars in northern Africa. He calls this book Liber Abaki, which means the book of calculation. There's some pictures of what that book looked like. Fibonacci includes a word problem in his book about breeding rabbits that became a very famous word problem, a very famous sequence of numbers that shows up in, in many fascinating areas. And the problem looks like this. It says, a man puts a pair of baby rabbits into an enclosed garden. Assuming each pair of baby rabbits bears a new pair every month, which from the second month on itself becomes productive. How many pairs of baby rabbits how many, I'm sorry, how many pairs of rabbits will there be in, a, in the garden after one year? Okay, so to understand this question and, and then to figure out the answer, I've got a picture here that will help us uh, understand. So the B stands for baby, the A stands for adult. We have one pair of baby rabbits in the garden to start. That pair of baby rabbits a month later becomes adult. So now they're adults. This is a pair of adult rabbits. Once they're adults, they produce... Uh, a pair of baby rabbits, which then will go on to grow to be a pair of adult rabbits one month later. The adult rabbits that we had, we still have, and they again produce another pair of baby rabbits. And so uh, it's starting to branch out this tree like this. So the pair of adult rabbits are still there. They've produced another pair of baby rabbits, which go on to become adults. The pair that was originally there produced another pair of baby rabbits. And 
if you imagine this sort of theoretical question, is if, if this continued, how many would you have uh, in a year? So you can see that the, what I'm counting over here on the far right column is how many pairs I have. I have one pair. I still have one pair. Then there are two pairs. Then there are three pairs. Then there are five pairs. And we go on like that. And this is called the Fibonacci sequence. One, one, two, three, five. And it continues. And you can discover that we, uh, one soon discovers that to find each number in the sequence, uh, we can just add the previous two numbers. That's a fascinating little property of the sequence is how when you add 1 plus 1, you get 2, and 1 plus 2, you get 3, and 2 plus 3, you get 5, and 3 plus 5 is 8, and 5 and 8 is 13, and 8 and 13 is 21, and so on. Continue adding the previous two numbers to get the next number. So to answer Fibonacci's question, we're going to look at the 12th month. Now look at the 12th month. Uh, that's 144 pairs, which is 288 rabbits total. So the answer is 288 rabbits for that, for that question. Now, the numbers in the Fibonacci sequence have been discovered in some pretty amazing places over the years, since Fibonacci wrote about them over 800 years ago. For example, in the arrangements of leaves on a stem, in the spirals on pine cones and sunflowers, uh, the number of uh, petals is uh, very often, not always, but very often, more than seems... Uh, chance uh, to be to be a Fibonacci number. This picture over on the left is um, a diagram indicating the way in which leaves on a stem will uh, sprout in such a way that they don't uh, block the sunlight of leaves below. If you were a plant, you would want your leaves to uh, get sunlight and not have leaves on top of other leaves creating uh, shadows. And so there's a little bit of rotation there in the ways in which the leaves will sprout from the stem. And that uh, rotation is uh, very, very close to this uh, value that's called the golden number, or the golden ratio, and it comes from uh, the further you go along the Fibonacci sequence, uh, you keep dividing numbers next to each other, and you get closer and closer to this number called the golden ratio. Here you see eight petals, that's a Fibonacci number. Thirteen spirals, that's a Fibonacci number. Here's thirteen petals, and that's a picture uh, with a flower with five petals, another Fibonacci number. This is a uh, spiral uh, that's created by making um, squares that are each um, a Fibonacci number. So if I start uh, in here with a square that has a one side by one side uh, length and put two of them together, uh, and then I make one that's three and then one that's, I'm sorry, this would be two and then three, Put the two and the three together and you get five, make a square on top of that. Put the five and the three together and you get eight, make, put, make a, put a square there. If you put the five and the eight together, you get a side that's equal to 13 and make a square that's equal to 13. And then um, if you do, uh, well, I guess we have a, a 13 and a three and a five, or let's say 13 and eight. If you make a side that's 13 and eight, you get a side that's 21. Another square that's 21 by 21. And you connect all the corners and make this really pretty spiral. Uh, that shows up in all sorts of places in nature. Here's a picture of a spiral arm of a, of a galaxy. We also find spirals in, in hurricanes, uh, and so you can uh, see these spirals all sorts of places in nature. Uh, some people use Fibonacci to uh, look at the patterns of the ups and downs in the stock market. Um, even uh, on the human body, there are two eyes, five appendages, and uh, if you count the head, and five fingers and uh, toes on each hand and foot, and all those are Fibonacci numbers. So Fibonacci seem to relate to fundamental principles that are involved in growth. Uh, perhaps that's why these numbers are found so frequently in nature. Uh, dividing Fibonacci numbers produces another interesting number called the golden ratio, which is found in many interesting places, even used in analysis of, of uh, ups and downs in the stock prices. This is a photograph of a sunflower up close that my wife took, and I went through here and I counted the number of spirals, and going all the way around and counting each spiral and where it terminates and giving it a number all the way around, counting every single spiral, I came up with 34 spirals, and 34 is a Fibonacci number. So the book in which these Fibonacci numbers first appear is called Libra Rabaki, and it's a huge book. It's 672 pages. 
It's divided into 15 chapters. Chapter 1 in the book Fibonacci writes, these are the nine figures of the Indians. He's referring to uh, the numbers from India that uh, he's introducing. He's introducing these numbers to Europe for many people. For most people, this is for the first time. He says, with these nine figures and with the sign zero, which in Arabic is zephyrum, which is any number can be written uh, as will be demonstrated. So he's saying if you take all the nine figures, one through nine and the zero, you can write any number as he's going to demonstrate. So that's where he begins in chapter one. Here are the numbers, and you can write anything with these numbers, he says. Uh, and then he goes through chapter two, three, four, five. He deals with how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide with positive and negative whole numbers uh, written in these Hindu Arabic numbers. So he's um, doing this for the benefit of people who are writing with uh, Roman numbers. Uh, and, uh, and much of what he's explaining, uh, he explains in the same way that it would be done today. Chapters 6 and 7 deal with adding and subtracting, multiplying and dividing with fractions. And many of the examples involve mixed numbers and just like we do today, Fibonacci explains how to rewrite the mixed number as an improper fraction, and perform those required operations and then uh, convert back into the form of a mixed number. So um, he's explaining how to do this kind of work here when you go from a mixed fraction to an improper fraction, how to do the math, the arithmetic and then how to convert back uh, in, in his examples. In chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11 deal with mathematics that occur in business situations and in commercial bookkeeping. For example, it deals with combining positive numbers as credits and negative numbers as debits. So he explains things like if you uh, were in, working in your checkbook and you had a 100 plus a 25, that adds up to 125. If you had a 100 and a negative 25, that would add to positive 75. If you had, let's say, a $100 charge in your checkbook and a $25 credit, then you would have a negative $25, no, I'm sorry, negative $75 balance. So, so he's explaining how to add and subtract with positive and negatives uh, by using money as, a, as the explanation, which is what we still do today. And uh, two negatives together make a negative. A hundred dollar charge and a twenty-five dollar charge, uh, that would be a hundred and twenty-five total charge. Uh, chapter ten, use fractions to explain how to price goods. Think about how grocery grocery stores determine the price of items per pound and per ounce. An example that Fibonacci used was if two pounds of barley cost five dollars, how much should seven pounds cost? He explained how to use the same mathematical methods to manage investments and distribute profits in companies. In chapter 11, he dealt with converting between different types of money. These were uh, essentially applications of fractions that problems that were done in the beginning chapters. In chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15 of the Liberabaki, it deals with algebra and geometry, and it's in chapter 12 that he has that famous rabbit problem. So Fibonacci wrote his book, Libra Baki, to explain how much better those Hindu Arabic numbers that we now use are when compared to the Roman numerals. He included many examples of real-life mathematics that made the book very useful to many people. Uh, this is an example of comparing, doing a calculation with an abacus versus, a, uh, versus the uh, Hindu Arabic numbers, and this is a book from the picture from the Middle Ages. Fibonacci was honored by the Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick II, in 1240 uh, because of his contributions to math and science. This is a picture of a, a Muslim scholar being honored by Frederick II. Um, so it, it may, maybe I'm just using that as a picture, just trying to imagine what it would have been like uh, with Fibonacci. And so we use numbers every day for everything, prices, Distances, weight, size, time, scores, the list goes on and on. Uh, in science, almost everything we know, we only know because we can describe it in terms of numbers and equations. Business depends, for example, on calculations of profit, loss, payments, and interest. With the right tool, our job is much easier. In 1202, Fibonacci demonstrated to Europe how the Hindu-Arabic numbers 
are the right tool for many different jobs. And it was eventually by the 1500s that all of Europe had converted from using Roman numerals to using Hindu Arabic numbers. Uh, this is a book uh, that if you're interested in this, you could read more. A lot of what I got here in this video comes from uh, the book, The Man of Numbers, Fibonacci's Arithmetic Revolution by Keith Bevel. Okay, that's the end of my video.